Hello, everyone. As I was saying, we have Patrick Dempsey, who we know from Grey's Anatomy and films like Sweet Home, founder of Dempsey Racing. And I noticed he's wearing a Monaco, which is very appropriate for this evening. We have, in case you haven't yet noticed anyone, Jean-Claude Biver, who is regarded as an expert and authority on every aspect of Swiss watchmaking. Very importantly, we have Haig Altunian, who is the person consigning the Monaco that is going on auction on December 12th and was Steve McQueen's personal mechanic and also full of fascinating stories about racing life and about his relationship with he, Steve McQueen. We have Paul Boutros from Phillips who can tell us how he talked Hey, and finally auctioning the watch. We have Frederic Arnaud, who is the man with the greatest responsibility here. He's the CEO of Hog Hoyer, which produces the Monaco. And we also have Catherine Everlay duveau who is the heritage director of Tog Hoyer, which means she runs the museum, which means she gets to look at two, uh, two Monacos worn by Steve McQueen every day. That is enough to drive any watch nerd crazy because we'd all love to do that. What I'd like to do is just very quickly say a few things about the watch. First of all, all of us love beautiful, fascinating objects, even when they put, this is a chronograph that measures, a, and it's the, what's coming up for our dial. And almost all of us appreciate some Hollywood glamour. And this watch has a lot of glamour. After all, it's the watch Steve McQueen chose to wear in the 1970 movie Le Mans. And it's hard to be more glamorous than the King of Cool, whose character was Michael Delaney in that film. And all of us enjoy a mystery. And for years, a mystery surrounded this watch. How many were worn by Steve McQueen during the filming of Le Mans? Well, I'm gonna deal with that last point first, very quickly. On many occasions, the property master on that film, a man named Don Nunley, has stated there were six 1133Bs Monaco's with blue dials on the set, and all six were worn by Steve McQueen. In 2015, in case there's any doubt, the actual invoice was discovered and published within the pages of the Wall Street Journal after it had been authenticated by Catherine, I'd like to add. So <laughs> one of the things Don Nunley said about Steve McQueen is that he had the uncanny ability to select the right outfit. And in this case, he was wearing a beautiful white racing suit. And Don Nunley had laid out too much attention to himself. And Monica led my first question. Was, so let's talk about the future, what it's like to be a driver at Le Mans during that 24 hour race. Hello? Yes, hear me? hello, I'm sorry, you're cutting in and out, but I think the history of the race itself as a document to the experience, I think even after so many years have passed, 50 years now, the, the race in essence is captured on film. It's timeless. It's this beautiful little time capsule where the experience is very similar. The atmosphere, of course, the technology has changed. And I think the one thing that I always remember about the movie is the ride height of the 917. I think there's a, a, a moment in the lore in the history that I think McQueen himself was laying down in the middle of the track on the Molson. And um, <clears throat> I think it was uh, 
Bell was coming at him and didn't understand what was going on, who was on the on the track, but they were racing. And he captures this amazing image of the 917 coming at camera and you get a sense of the technology and how it's evolved over time. And certainly it's true for the watch and the style in which it was created in the packaging in the, uh, in the square dial was really avant-garde at the time. And I think people didn't know how to accept it. And it wasn't until the movie that this watch has become so iconic. So this in itself is a real movie star and the King of Cool, which is so appropriate that McQueen picked it out because the two um, have had success now in, in movie history and as time goes by, but not in that moment when it was first created, which is quite fascinating and a real lesson for all of us to remember, I think. And how important is it then for what Don Nunley says that Steve McQueen had an uncanny ability to pick the right outfit to go with his character. How important is that for an actor? Oh, I think it's hugely important. It settles you in, it helps anchor you into the character. It's a ritual like anything you do prior to getting into a car. There, people have rituals, they have a process that helps them um, to get centered, to be in character, if you will. Okay. So all those things add up. And even when you're racing at Le Mans, you have this watch on your wrist. You, you, it's not lost on you, the history, the heritage, in what it means. And it also makes you remember to be in the moment that this is your time and what will come of it. Where will you be in the legacy and the history of, of this particular brand and in this particular race? So all those things, I think, to your point and to the wardrobe, that all goes into the experience. Okay, Patrick, um, Excuse me, Michael. Um, Patrick, I have one, one, one question or I would like you to tell some, some kind of an anecdote uh, about the watch that I see you're wearing. Um, uh, well, this the is the time... one of this Sorry? is the commemorative watch that I what we I think debuted at Le Mans a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and have this on. And it's always a constant reminder for me of my experience and my relationship with Le Mans, the history of that race, and also Jack Hoyer, you know, and the vision that he had in what he created as such a young man. Um, in this period of time. And some things came out, they were immediate success. And then this one took some time for it to take off and has now become this legendary watch. Um, but the, to me, it's all those things are, are wrapped up in what this represents. I really love the way you put it. And uh, it reminds me the first time we met when uh, it was the first time you came to the factory for the visit, you had uh, the, this beautiful gray vintage Monaco on your wrist and you, you explained that um, it was for you as if you had to, 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 to go for it uh, while you were racing. Uh, if I remember what well, it was in Belgium. Yes, it was in Belgium. I picked it up there and it was right before I went to Spa for the very first time. Patrick Long, who was my co-driver uh, in the WC, he and I discovered this watch, little watch shop uh, in Brussels and we went in um, and I saw it and I was like, what a perfect memory to have. It was beginning the whole season, the 2015 season, I just finished Grays and it was a nice little moment to give myself and also to have a relationship with the brand in that era. I think it was a very special moment. And uh, the gentleman who sold it to me, his father raced in that era and we had a great discussion. So it becomes much more about the watch, but the yeah. time and the exchange and the moment that you have with collectors and with people and then the history of that watch that you absorb as a collector. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's really um, very powerful and very emotional when, uh, when you come to talk about this watch and this experience, because it also shows that a watch is much more than, than the watch. And uh, the, the, the Monaco we are discussing here with uh, Patrick is uh, the exact same one as the, the one that uh, uh, Steve McQueen was, uh, was wearing in the movie Le Mans and that uh, uh, the uh, extraordinary um, uh, one that we have here, thanks to uh, Mr. Altunian, uh, but it's, it's in the gray version. Is that correct? Huh? In my, my memory is correct on that. That is correct. The gray yes. one. Yeah. The gray one, which is beautiful. It's really subtle. It's elegant, classic. Yeah. Okay. Michael, do you want to, to go yeah. on or? I'll go on. No, I'm fine. If you can all hear me, because yes. we want to come to Jean-Claude next. Jean-Claude, 
this watch, as you know, is highly innovative. One of the first automatic chronographs, the first square chronograph, but also its color. It's flashy, it's loud, it challenges convention as the 1960s did when the watch appeared. And you often say you were a hippie back in those days. So I'd like to ask you, do you think this watch, because of its innovation and because of its appearance, as Patrick said, the square case is very much of its time and that makes it timeless. What do you think? Yes, I think it's uh, a very disruptive watch. <laughs> Black Hoyer was a disruptive guy. Uh, he disrupted sponsoring. He was the first one uh, to really exploit sponsoring in the racing cars. Uh, he was a pioneer. And to be a pioneer, you cannot be a pioneer if you are a follower. You must be avant-garde. And when you are avant-garde, means you somehow destroy tradition in order to build the future. You cannot build the future by copying the past. So, uh, and the watch represents for me this incredible, maybe one of the first strong, powerful disruption. Uh, it's disrupted by the colors. It's disrupted by the case. It's disrupted by the movement. Everything is disruption. And racing cars are disruptive cars. They are not the traditional cars you are driving in the country. They are disruptive. And in that sense, the watch fits at perfection racing. And it's the first watch that was made with the mentality of a racer. It was made by a racer because Jack Hoyer was also racing cars. And it was his second passion. He yeah. had two big passions. Passion one is watches and passion two was racing. And eventually passion three is skiing. <laughs> and <laughs> this, this guy has to be remembered as the first disruptive boss in the watch industry. Okay, well, that's high praise indeed. Now, another question though, this watch appears in 1969 the same time at the start of the quartz crisis. So is this some kind of pinnacle in Swiss watchmaking? It comes out at the start of a bad time for mechanical watchmaking, but it reaches such a height that it, it scales to a pinnacle for the entire industry. And it's one of the things that helps the industry keep going at that point in time. What do you think about that as a state? I think what I haven't uh, uh, mentioned before is the substance of the watch. It's not enough that the watch has a story, history. It's not enough that the watch is disruptive or that the watch has an emotion. At the end, it must also have substance. And what's the substance in that watch? That's the movement. The plate comes from Burlen and the chronograph from Dubois des Bras. God damn, these are two enormous <laughs> people that have done miracles. Dubois des Bras still today. You look at the luxury watches that are offered today, how, how you will find that a lot are made by Dubois des Bras. Perpetual calendars, uh, uh, minute repeaters, uh, chronograph. So the watch, has a brilliant, a brilliant past in the movement. It was a micro rotor, micro rotor. People today, I, sometimes I read that they are proud to have a micro rotor. Come on, 1969, we had already a micro rotor. So there are elements in the watch that gives to that watch its third dimension. And we always need three dimension. That's what we need. And the watch has the three dimensions. It has the history, it has the substance, and it has the shape, disruptive shape. There are not many watches in, uh, made in a, a, a square, a square. 
Uh, and who made the case? It was the case maker with the name Picre. People who are collectors, they know who is Picre. Picre is a reference for case maker. He was one of the most brilliant specialists in uh, building cases. And only somebody like Picre could have done a water resistant square What? If you look at the portholes of boats, you will never find any boat with a square porthole because square is a nightmare to make it water resistant. That's why all the portals are either round or oval, but never square. And Picre was capable to produce this unique, exceptional case, square, and to make it water resistant. So you see, there are so many elements in that watch. And that's why the watch is still a reference. That's why the watch has entered eternity. You can only enter eternity with perfection. If you are not perfect, you cannot enter uh, 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 eternity. You will become obsolete. But if you are at perfection, then you enter eternity. And that watch is eternity. So as you often say, this watch is eternity in a box. Yes, <laughs> in a square box, exactly. OK. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Catherine, any questions for Jean-Claude? Well, um, no? he said it's okay. all. I'm, I'm very moved by, uh, by the words and the, uh, the energy that, uh, that uh, Mr. Biver is, is sharing with us. And uh, uh, all the technical details uh, are absolutely uh, perfectly right and, uh, and well uh, explained. And um, what I would like to add is that on the 3rd of March, 69, when uh, Jack Hoyer launched the Calibre 11, he launched it um, with the three collections that we all know, Carrera, Ottavia, and Monaco. And Monaco was really the pinnacle of avant-garde. Uh, he knew he was doing something that probably in terms of, uh, of uh, convention standards, he should not do, but he wanted to do it to disrupt, to, to be different, to be himself, uh, to be square, blue, uh, with a crown on the left side, instead of uh, usually being round, black or silver, and the crown on the right side. And uh, he made it. And um, by being so different, he made the legend and uh, today we are all here to celebrate this, this eternity uh, with uh, probably, if not the most beautiful example of this Monaco, uh, well, definitely one of the very, very few uh, most beautiful. I am not, uh, I, I'm not the one who can say uh, that I prefer this watch from the other ones, but this one has really something completely different. and. Uh, and I'm happy and proud that we have uh, Mr. Altunian with us to, to tell us more about this. Well, my next question is for Haig. Haig, you're a, I'm guy, out of, you're a guy out of Van Nuys, California. You become in your 20s, one of the world's leading race car mechanics, but your journey there starts in a furniture store. Why don't you tell us of that? Um, I started employment at the age of 11 years old. And uh, my first employer, owner of a furniture store, had a passion for European sports cars. And at that time, I was exposed To, that he owned, uh, Alfa Romeo, Austin Healey, Jaguar, um, Talbo, uh, MG, Austin Mini Coopers, and um, that started my passion, which later developed into being a professional racing mechanic. And by around 1970, you're a mechanic for Team Porsche in the Can-Am series in the USA. 
1969. 1969, you began. And someone comes to you and says, we'd like you to work with Steve McQueen, who's going to be making a film in <clears throat> Le Mans. We'd like you to be his mechanic. What did you think then? What went through your mind? Um, an opportunity. Um, I, I did want to travel. Um, and a continuation of uh, the first meeting and uh, uh, tune-up racing with Steve. Uh, I was uh, taken by it. Uh, he instructed his company, uh, Solar Productions, to make sure that they hired me uh, to work on the film and to be his mechan personal mechanic and chief mechanic for all the mechanics and cars in the film. Okay. And what happened that year before you went to France? What happened at Sebring? Steve had a broken foot and he had to race at Sebring 12 hours with a broken foot? Yes. Um, prior to Sebring, uh, we did a few tune-up races in uh, uh, Southern California and in uh, Phoenix, Arizona with the Porsche 908. And uh, we prepared the car to go to Sebring. Uh, Peter Revson was hired to be his co-driver. And a, it was either a week or two weeks before the Sebring race, Steve participated in a prototype in Lake Elsinore, California, where he broke his foot. Uh, the foot was put into a cast and uh, not slowing him down or stopping him for participating, uh, he competed at Sebring in a foot cast. And I might add, during the race, the cast broke and I had to repair it in the pits with uh, duct tape so that he could continue on. Right. Well, you can fix anything with duct tape. We, we <laughs> any American will tell you that. You can fix anything with duct tape. Okay. So a few months after that, you're in France. And as you just said, you're in charge of all the mechanics for all the cars. And you had a great story about how every day started driving through Le Mans with all the cars. What was that like? Tell us about those days. Well, <clears throat> it was, um, we, we would get the, uh, the call. Uh, the schedule was provided to us the night before. And uh, we had a garage where all the cars were housed just outside the little town of Arnage. And uh, every morning, depending on what time we were to uh, show up at the circuit, um, let's say hypothetically 6 a.m., 7 a.m., the local gendarmes on motorcycles would come to the garage. We would queue up the cars. I always drove the lead car. And the race cars were driven from the, through the city of Arnage, the little town of Arnage, on, on through the countryside to the racetrack to the designated area of the day. So that sounds like enormous fun, driving those beautiful cars like the 917 Porsche through a French town, escorted by the police. Was it a lot of fun? Did you enjoy it? Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, now on the day Steve gave you the watch, it was the last day of filming 
at Le Mans, last day of action filming. What happened that day? I mean, what was he doing in the car? Where was he driving and things like that? What was going on? We were filming the Mulsanne Strait and Mulsanne Corner. And depending on the weather, uh, as I remember, uh, it was a moderate day. We did have sunshine and then we had cloud over. So uh, depending on the sequence uh, where they wanted to film, um, we had to film both in the dry and in the wet because the actual race was experienced by weather, uh, rain and dry. So, and the film company, we, we uh, had, a, had contracted a water truck, a construction water truck, which we would wet down the, the course uh, in the designated area filming of the day to provide rain shots. Um, and that was uh, maintained by the special effects department. Um, but uh, as I remember, we filmed both dry scenes and wet scenes that last day of shooting, uh, which meant the cars had to be weathered and then they had to be moderately cleaned. So it was a lot of work to, to produce the likeness, depending on the weather. And what kind of speeds would the cars have reached that day? Almost actual race speeds on the Molson Strait and Molson Corner. And what would that be, sorry, in miles or kilometers? Well, the, the, the actual filming, uh, uh, the speeds of the cars that day, as most people know, the larger cars as the 917 Porsches, mm -hmm. actual race speeds were over 200 miles an hour. I estimate uh, the speeds that we filmed at that day were close to or just under 200 miles per hour. So the watch Steve eventually gave you and the watch that's going up for auction on the 12th was on his wrist while he was racing at around 200 miles an hour. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. Now, so what happens? Steve finishes driving for the day and where are you at that time? Our designated pit area for the day was just inside Mulsanne Corner in the infield. Um, at the last shot, when they called it a wrap, the cars filtered into that designated pit area. And uh, Steve parked the 917 number 20 that he was driving that particular day and uh, took off his gloves, stepped out of the car, took his helmet off, set it on the roof of the 917. And at that time, his family, uh, Neil, his wife, Terry, his daughter, and Chad, his son, uh, joined him and it, emotional exchanges were between his family and himself. And then he walked over to the back of the car where I was in attendance and unbuckled the watch and said, I want to give you this. Thank you for keeping me alive all these months. And I reluctantly refused. And I believe I mentioned that, don't you want to keep this or give it to your son or he said, sorry, it's too late, with, with a sheepish grin and a chuckle. 
and handed me the watch. She said, too late, it's had your name on it. And uh, then shook my hand. And it, he had already had it engraved, right? To Hague from Steve LeMond's 1970. Great. So that, took, that took me by surprise. That's so sweet. I can so, only uh, imagine the emotion that you, you, you might have, uh, have felt. Because uh, it's just like what Patrick was saying, it's, 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 it was not just a watch. I was elated. Your pulse was racing. Racing pulse, the theme of the yacht. Inspired by that moment. Okay, Paul. He was very, he was very generous to me. And it wasn't just uh, just for the film. You kept in touch. You you were friends, weren't you? Yes, yes. And you told for me. The, for, for, the, for the next couple of years, we saw each other off and on. Okay. And you went to their house, the family McQueen house at various times. But sometimes you told me a story about he used to bump into you with his truck in Beverly Hills. What was that yeah, about? At that time, I maintained a P.O. box in Beverly Hills, and I would make a daily trek into Beverly Hills from my home in Santa Monica to pick up my mail. And uh, uh, at that time, I was my daily driver was an Austin Mini Cooper, which I still own. And uh, uh, in driving through Beverly Hills, uh, occasionally um, he drove when he wasn't filming, uh, he'd let himself go uh, beard wise, hair wise, and uh, you wouldn't recognize him. Uh, and he drove this hopped up, beat up pickup. Ford pickup truck. And uh, occasionally he would see me um, in Beverly Hills and pull up behind me and just nudge the back of my car and motion me over. And in downtown Beverly Hills, sit on the curb and jaw a while, and uh, then go on our merry way. But uh, I was invited several times to his home in Brentwood, and uh, also his retreat in uh, Palm Springs. And the watch all these years, because that's it's more than 50 years actually or just about 50 years it meant friendship it meant what did it mean to you after all this time sentimental value um something that uh, the memories that i will cherish and until i'm i'm gone okay and of course an important element in the story is Paul Boutros, who somehow or another hears about this watch and explains to Haig that it should be auctioned. Paul, how did you first know about the watch? Thanks, Michael. Yep, it, it all started with an email. In the type of email we all dream of, uh, it said, it was, it was written to Aurel and it stated, a friend of mine has the Hoyer Monaco that was worn by Steve McQueen on the final day of filming. Uh, I think you're the perfect person to auction this watch. Uh, please contact me. So as it was from an American client, Aurel forwards the, the message to me and he says, what do you think? And I was like, wow. Uh, I, of course, Michael, I've read your article about all of the um, Le Mans Monaco watches. Uh, and I knew that there was one still out there. And I was hoping it was Hague's. As, of course, I had seen the documentary, Steve McQueen, The Man in Le Mans. And there is a wonderful scene where Hague is interviewed, telling the story, the exact story, of receiving the watch on the final day of filming. I said, either this is a, a, a joke or it's the real deal. And immediately, I reached out to the friend and said, we were so excited to receive this message. Please call me at your earliest convenience. 
So we spoke and for sure it was legitimate. And then this was, this was July, 2018. And by November, 2018, finally, we were able to make arrangements. I flew to Los Angeles to meet with the friend and also with Haig. And Haig brought the watch. We met at a, at a fantastic del delicatessen, Nate and Al's in Beverly Hills. And he pulls out a box after we, we, we have some small talk. We talk about prior auctions and, and uh, Haig's life as a mechanic and, and his career. And he says, well, do you want to see it? I said, of course, please. <laughs> <laughs> he pulls out the box. Uh, it's, a ta it's, a, it's, a, it's a vintage Hoyer box. And we, I open it. And of course, it's immediate goosebumps. Uh, one look at it, and I knew this watch was unpolished. It was well-preserved. It was exactly as collectors would dream it would be, uh, as good as it gets. Uh, I knew in my hands it was one of the most important wristwatches of the 20th century. And what a thrill. What a rush. Uh, of course, this is November 2018. I think there were three more trips to Los Angeles to meet with Haig to get him to trust us, to let him know that we would do this watch justice as we take great responsibility for shining a light on the importance of you know, great watches like this. And fast forward to February, 2020, one month before the pandemic began, I took one of my last trips uh, and uh, it was to meet with Haig, uh, once again at Nate and Al's over Pastrami on Rye <laughs> and Haig signed the contract and the watch was in my hands. And I, I sent an email, I sent a text to Aurel, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, excellent. And the auction is December 12th, correct? Yes, so, so yeah, as, as I mentioned, that moment where Haig received the watch from Steve McQueen, uh, you can imagine uh, how excited Haig was and, and Haig, uh, Steve McQueen driving at speeds over 200 miles per hour with that watch on his wrist, that inspired the theme. Racing Pulse of the Auction taking place on December 12th. Uh, the watch is so important uh, and there's this iconic picture, uh, the movie poster of Le Mans with Steve McQueen and, and Haig Altunian just behind him in front of the Porsche 917. Uh -huh. um, we, uh, we, we featured the watch on the cover, well-deserved, uh, one of the most important wristwatches of the 20th century that we're thrilled to offer. Yes, thank you. And I think I also, if I may, have to interject at this moment. I want to thank <laughs> Paul for telling me about this a few months ago and Haig for spending a good two hours on the phone with me so I could write an article about this watch in WSJ Magazine. A little um which appeared a few months ago so thanks to both of you for that now is frederick still with us yes yes i'm frederick here. frederick i'd like to come to you because in some ways you have the biggest responsibility of anyone here this evening because you are now the ceo of todd coyer this wonderful magnificent brand and you're in charge of the future progress of this particular watch, the Monaco, which is, as Paul has just said, as John claude has said, something that will live forever. It's one of the most important watches of the 20th century. So we'd like to know, how did you first hear about the Monaco? And how do you feel? What's it like to be in charge of something like that? Um, thank you. So uh, maybe on the first question, how I first, um heard of the Monaco. Actually, it's when I was, uh, well, inexperienced. I didn't know much about watches. Uh, and uh, um, it's a watch uh, that uh, my, my older brother was wearing. And uh, it's actually one of the first watches that I, uh, that I actually noticed. Uh, because um, I, I really believe this watch in itself uh, stands out uh, uh, with uh, the, its design, you know, the square case, but also the, the dial which is very expressive, the, the color combinations. Uh, and it's uh, yeah, one of the first watches I, I, I really noticed. Uh, and then uh, uh, it, it built uh, into me. I, um, I started hearing about uh, you know, the, the story uh, behind it and also uh, um, uh, how 
disruptive it was uh, at the launch, as uh, as Jean Claude was was explaining. You know, it's uh, the design is important to it, but there's also a real uh, movement story behind uh, the the launch of this watch, and of course uh, uh, this uh, uh, iconic movie uh, and uh, and Steve uh, to whom it's linked. Uh, so um, it's one of the yeah, first watch I noticed and uh, that got me uh, interested in watches and uh, attracted me also uh, to, to the brand uh, Tag Heuer. Uh, and um, uh, it's a very deep uh, uh, story uh, linked uh, with this watch. Uh, then on, on the second question, uh, you know, how, how, to manage, how to manage this icon? Uh, so you know, we have the chance of having a, a, an icon in the brand. Uh, it's more than 50 years old. Uh, the design is almost uh, unchanged compared to uh, when it was first launched, um, uh, great uh, disruptive story had launched, and uh, uh, Steve uh, that that really kick started uh, uh, the um, uh, world uh, uh, knowledge on this um, on, on on this watch. Uh, now I believe that the brands really have a role to play in sustaining and and managing an icon an, an icon uh, and uh, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, they keep their desirability and even increase their desirability over time. Uh, and uh, us as, as a brand, we really have, uh, um, uh, we believe in this collection for the long term. I mean, we want to, to of course, keep it as a, as a, as a pillar, uh, continue to build on it, uh, not uh, necessarily uh, uh, increase the share uh, uh, in, in, the, in the sales for the brand. You know, we, we don't want to massively develop it uh, in the contrary. You know, we want to preserve this watch and we want to preserve this collection. Uh, and uh, um, uh, um, you know, we, we are thinking of uh, you know, capping the production's volumes and we believe it's important to keep some, uh, some scarcity uh, on, this, uh, on this collection. We don't want to animate it too much uh, to really keep that uh, identity, which is, uh, which is so strong and so, uh, so recognizable. Uh, and also invest a lot on the, on the, on the movement. I mean, uh, um, you saw uh, last year we introduced for the first time our, our Hoyo O2 movement inside the Monaco, our latest uh, in-house manufacture movement with uh, uh, great technical features, the 80 hours power reserve, uh, vertical clutch. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a, a roadmap for the future. Um, you know, we are also uh, thinking of maybe um, doing a modern revival of the, the Calibre 11 because we have a Calibre 11 currently in the, uh, the collection, but um, there's features that are quite different from the original Calibre 11. And uh, one, one of them that Jean-Claude you were mentioning is the, the micro rotor. And uh, how, how cool would it be to you know, do a revival, a modern with modern techniques and with great finishings uh, uh, of, this, of, of this movement. And this is you know, topics we have in discussion. Uh, really, um, the key for us is, uh, um, how do we make sure that this watch is and will stay one of the most desirable watches out there uh, in, in, in the future and investing on a resale value also. We know how, how important that is you know, for buyers, collectors, that uh, when they, they purchase a watch, uh, they know this value behind it and that uh, it keeps its value over time. Uh, the fact it was so untouched is, uh, I mean, it's great. Uh, and there's very few watches like that out there. And uh, um, resale value uh, for us is uh, really something we, we look closely at for this watch and that will uh, you know, continue to develop. Okay, thank you. That is fascinating. And let's hope the resale value of the watch on December the 12th is enormous. Um, okay. Thank you everyone. I want to particularly thank Haig for telling us his stories about Steve McQueen. Thank Patrick for telling us about what it's like to race and how important an outfit is to an actor. And oh, oh, and of course, thank John Claude. And also, just to point out something John Claude said, Jack Hoyer was a disruptor and a pioneer. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the watch proves is that when you start out that way, you can keep going for a very long time, maybe forever. 
Okay, Catherine, why don't we hand over to questions now? Yes, exactly. That's what I was about to, um, to suggest. Um, thank you very much for the, 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 the great um, share that, uh, that, that we had with you. And now um, uh, let's, uh, let's have our uh, guests uh, asking you some questions. The first one is for you, uh, Mr. Altunian. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm reading at the same time as I am uh, asking you this question. Uh, at what occasions have you been wearing the watch in the past? And I'm quite curious myself on that. How did the history of the watch continue with you? Uh, special evenings, uh, parties, um, special dining affairs. Um, being yeah, I, my guess it, I guess it might have helped when you told the story of, of this watch. Well, you know, until just recently, I really did not discuss the watch with too many people. Okay. Okay, so mainly you kept it um, uh, carefully. Yes, and then later on, uh, I realized that uh, uh, it, it's potential value and I put it away in a safety deposit box. Thank you very much. That's the reason why the watch is in such good condition. That's true. But after 50 <laughs> years, the watch looks like new. It's I mean, that's remarkable. And that's, that's not because of Tag Heuer, it's because of you, eh? You took yeah. care well, of me. <laughs> Jean-Claude, Jean -Claude, I appreciate your passion. <laughs> we share, we share passion. Pa <laughs> <laughs> and you know, passion is love. So we share That's love. Right. And all I you agree. need is love. <laughs> uh, I agree. <laughs> And uh, last one that uh, uh, obviously um, many attendees have on their lips. Uh, what made you decide to put the watch for auction at this point in time? Um, my age, health, planning my estate and uh, wanting to secure future for my family. And if I may add, you transmit, you transfer the watch. It means the watch goes on. Mm -hmm. That's and that correct. is important. After us, the watch remains in hands of other people. And that is very important. We cannot take the watch as a prisoner of us. We must give it back. And you are giving it back. Therefore, the, we must thank you. Thank you. The legend lives on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is really important. And uh, you're right. Um, a watch is something that transmits much more than just uh, what time it is. Oh, yes. Very true. Very the nice. next question is for you, Paul. Um, Philip auctions off the most amazing watch pieces around the world. And you told us uh, uh, how you got to know about this very one. Is this a piece you had on your radar? You, 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 you were dreaming of, uh, of hammering at some point? Uh, or better said, do you have a watch hunting wish list? Absolutely. Uh, when I first watched that documentary, uh, The Man in Le Mans, Steve McQueen, and I heard Haig's story, that was my, my, my sights were set on, on one day getting that watch. And of course, combined with Michael Clarizzo's exhaustive and definitive article on the watches of Le Mans. This was at the top of my, my wish list to one day get. And sure enough, here we are. Thanks to Haig's trust. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're absolutely honored and thrilled to be able to offer it. Uh, and yes, the hunt goes on. This is what we live for. We search the world for the greatest timepieces. Uh, it's what keep us keep what's what keep us fueled. Uh, this passion and and presenting and, and sharing these these 
these trophies with the community is what we what we love to do. And there are more out there, but this one we're we're super thrilled about, and uh, can't wait to auction it on the twelfth. Yeah, and who knows what's what's going to happen? No? Mm. Yes, who knows? Uh, but uh, we're we're really excited. <laughs> yeah, K Catherine. Yes. I, I would like to say this, that a, pro, a portion of the proceeds will be donated to Steve McQueen charity, Boys Republic. Boys Republic. Great. The one that he cherished all along his life uh, for himself having been an orphan and uh, having, um, you know, wanted to, to share part of his uh, his fame and wealth with uh, with uh, with uh, those kids. That's great. Thank you very that's much it. for. I mean, that's wonderful. Thank you, Hague, for very doing moving. this. Thank I didn't you, know Hague. you were doing it. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Um, Patrick, next one is for you. You are a passionate race car driver. And uh, we'd like to know what does a watch represent for you during the race? And um, if you could um, describe us the importance of such pieces um, for racing back, uh, back then and now. Yes, I wore my Monaco watch. Uh, every, I competed in Le Mans four times and, and each one has a special memory to me. And every time I look at those specific models, I have a flood of memories that come back to me, which is remarkable. And in racing is all about time. It's how fast can you be? Are you the fastest one? And, and, and it's so symbolic to have that on your wrist, especially in between when you have a moment to collect yourself or you're in a virtual yellow, you do take a time to look at your wrist and see where you're at in, in the overall time. So it's kind of fun to be doing that and competing and part of the whole history uh, to me was a surreal, beautiful, sublime moment and was really great to be a part of and to have that history and that connection all at this moment is really quite special to me. Talking about passion, it is love and you feel that within the racing community. And certainly when you're successful, there is a tremendous amount of celebration and love there because of the struggle it takes to be able to get to that place. So I think all the time, the energy, commitment, innovation, uh, it's all symbolized in what this watch represents. And what's, what strikes me um, here, and it's specifically uh, um, tonight or this morning or, or today, depending on when you are on, on the planet, um, is that uh, um, uh, the connection between the driver and his mechanics and, and, and this very deep um, uh, trust that uh, they must have um, Heg, you told that so well, and it's, uh, it's also a very moving part of the story. Um, it's about trust and it's about uh, being on time because um, you driver, you have to be fast and to be there, but you mechanics, you have to, to, to do what you have to do on the car as fast as possible. So it's, it's a race for, for both on both sides and the link between, them, between the two of you is really this piece, this watch. It's a, it's a perfect triangle. Mm -hmm. It is, yes. Frédéric, one for you. Um, Tag Heuer has uh, already two of the Monaco uh, historic pieces from, from Le Mans in the museum. So who do you wish or who can you picture uh, would, uh, would, would get for this uh, very special one to go? If you could. <laughs> um. Having Heg next to you, no pressure. <laughs> I, I believe many people could be interested in uh, purchasing uh, such an iconic uh, watch. Huh? Um, people passionate about uh, racing, uh, the um, and uh, specifically also the, the, the Porsche brand, because you know there's a strong link with the 917 uh, Porsche present in this in this movie. Uh, People are uh, um, passionate about cinema and uh, especially this period. And, uh, and Steve, we know there's, there's a, a collector uh, who um, uh, purchased a lot of elements from this movie, uh, Le Mans, uh, and uh, I think already has one or two of the, uh, the, six, uh, the six watches. Um, watch collectors, of course, uh, who would be collecting uh, um, 
uh, also widely uh, other other watch brands uh, and uh, who could have or not uh, a Hoyer. And um, this watch has such a historic value that uh, they, they, they could be interested in, uh, in, in, in this watch. Um, um, so, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Think, Next uh, King of Fool. I, I would like to say that it would be nice if its presence would be shared. Yes. Yeah. Not kept for 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 a safe or for a, a private collection. Yeah, I understand what you mean specifically with uh, this um, this mention that you you just uh, you just made about Boys Republic. It's also about sharing and uh, and love again. So. Let's see, Paul, it will be uh, all on you on the 12th of December, next Saturday. We are looking very forward to it. And, and, Frédéric, and... next one is also for you, uh, but not on, uh, on, on the historical side of the Monaco, but more on the future one. Uh, Monaco now has the Hoya O2 caliber, you just, uh, you just uh, said it. Um, and uh, it's uh, one of the latest release uh, that has proven its versatility to grand complications and, 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 and other kind of movements. Uh, will we see a Monaco GMT in the future? And what about a skeleton one? Um, interesting question. Uh, um, so we want to invest on, on movement and uh, really specifically uh, on, this, on this collection. Um, um, uh, in terms of more specifically, what are we going to do? So I'm not going to announce uh, any, anything right now. Of course, it's a. Uh, uh, that was a good try, though. No? <laughs> uh, uh, the, the GMT, I feel it maybe a, a bit less, and and I, and I, and I don't see uh, you know more directly how we could uh, uh, do a great GMT GMT on the Monaco. Uh, however, a skeleton, you know, we we have the the Monaco V4. Uh, that uh, also is a, is a real milestone in, in the brand with uh, um, great innovation. You know, it was a movement that uh, was inspired from a, um, an, an engine uh, and uh, also the skeleton has looked uh, on, on the Monaco, I believe, uh, uh, works uh, very well. So this is something we could be thinking also of uh, um, uh, bringing back or making modern and actual. You know, we will always want to project the, the, the timepiece in the future, respecting uh, its uh, identity and, and, and uh, its origins. Frederick? Yes? If there's ever a future of a blue face Monaco, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> there will always be a blue face Monaco. That, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, but one go to Hague. I think that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> With a special engravement, Frédéric. Yes, exactly. We can, we can do that. <laughs> okay. Very that good. would be awesome. Thank you, Frédéric. Yes. Mr. Biver, uh, your turn now. Um, you are, uh, and we all know that, an avid collector of watches. Why would you recommend a watch aficionado to bid exactly on this very watch? I would like to buy it. Yeah. So I don't want to do too much advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> we, we hope to register you for bidding, Jean-Claude. <laughs> and there is it, almost it nobody. Be, it's just the six of us. It would very much fit into my, it would, it, it would fit in my collection. It would fit in my past, I have been uh, a fan of Tag Heuer. I've even worked at Tag Heuer. Uh, it would remember me, Jack Heuer, who is a great man. Um, <laughs> and um, it would remember me, Frédéric, who is the, uh, the new future and CEO of the brand. So you see, beside uh, buying the watch, I have four good reasons why I should uh, <laughs> try uh, to win uh, at the auction. So um, you can count on me. <laughs> yeah. I will be Bravo. there. <laughs> Bravo. We see the best of luck in your bidding, Jean-Claude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I'm speechless. I was just thinking that this is really a watch that could be the culmination of a, of a Hoyer collection, but that could also be a wonderful watch to start with Hoyer uh, mm -hmm. as a collector, as a as a collector, as a watch collector. Uh, so um, uh, it's a it's a it's a, an execution and a, a a piece of history, not just a, a watch history. Maybe we take uh, one more question, and uh, I guess that we have already uh, uh, passed uh, the, the, the due time. Um, I think uh, the that one that I, I think... have here is for you, Frédéric. Uh, with the passage among Hoyer and Tag Hoyer, some might feel that certain icons have been lost in translation. Do you have any plan to bring back some icons on the market? Um, um, and, uh, and 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 uh, the, the the guests uh, mentioned um, what uh, what Omega uh, is doing with uh, this uh, speedy concept. What do you think? Um, so um, I think we cannot decide. You know, uh, okay, this watch is going to be an icon. Uh, this is something also that uh, uh, really goes beyond the brand. Uh, I think Jack at the time uh, he had this disruptive design, but he didn't know. The resonance it was going to have and for how long uh and it's still today you know we would be talking uh about this watch and this and and, and this story um so um you know I, I don't think we can say oh we're gonna relaunch this watch and and, uh, and and make it an icon we have you know the monaco and and also other ones and we have the the, the carrera um uh, which are icons inside the brand now it's just how do we manage them in the future uh to really make sure that they they, they, they stay modern icons uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's great. We have uh, you know, a strong history uh, and there's all, there will always be uh, lovers of uh, vintage pieces, uh, but we have our responsibility is to make sure that uh, uh, collectors uh, also love uh, the, the modern watches that, that will launch uh, and for the years to come. Well, I think that, the, 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 that uh, what... Uh... Uh, Heg just said about the, the Monaco with the Hoya O2 is, uh, is the perfect conclusion for, for, to your answer, actually. Yes, definitely. So, Michael, I've give, I, I, I give you the, the, the floor back, and uh, I think it's time for all of us to, uh, to part and uh, to, to regroup on the Saturday the 12th again, 10 a.m. New York time. Um, and uh, wish good luck to lot number 20. Yes. yes. Thank you. We, we look forward to welcoming you, you all to watch the auction. 10 a.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Central Europe time, 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific time for you, Haig. And let's have some fireworks happen. And think Boys Republic too. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Great discussion. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, uh, again, thank you, Michael. It's been a, thank you, it's been a thank, you. thank you, everybody. Okay. To thank all this so good to see everybody. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank, thank you, everyone. So good to see you. I can't wait to see you in person soon. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Good to see you. You look fantastic. Good to see you. <laughs> it's been too long, everyone. Been too long. Yeah, far too long. Let's hope Thank we you. Can person again soon. Huh? I hope so. And, and Hag, it's great to meet you. It's actually the first time uh, we, 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 can, we speak to each other. <laughs> Did he go? Yeah, I said, Hag, it was really great to meet you. Uh, I, was, I was pleased to be able to, to talk to you uh, in this discussion. It was my pleasure. And in the future, I hope someday to visit Tag Heuer. Hope so. Yes. Or, I'll, I'll I mean, be happy to invite you in La, in La Chaux de Fonds. <laughs> thank you.